Well, hello and welcome to Mariner with me, Chris Stammel Major. And here we are in a space that you've not seen before. This is the nav station on board Osprey. We've got the bunks over here. We've got the doors going back to the lazarette area. Some of my nav gear behind. This is the underside of the uh, grinders up on deck. It's actually a, a bump camp I used to wear on my head to stop my head smack in the bottom of the grinder. I realized, just leave it here, never hit my head again. So an interesting space and uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to share much more of this boat with you and much more of what I'm doing in the next couple of weeks because we've got a very interesting challenge ahead of us. I've got to solo this boat, this 85 foot maxi from here in Southampton in the UK up to Reykjavik in Iceland. Now I realize for many people that the concept of soloing a boat like this is completely outside of anything you would normally do. For me it's certainly a step up and this kind of boat you know has been used in round the world uh, record events when uh, uh, Jean-Luc van den Heed went round the world for the West about uh, record. It was actually on a boat very similar size for this. This boat's not particularly set up for a solo sailor as it doesn't have a boom bag, it doesn't have a roller furling headsail. Uh, it does have an autopilot and I do know it very well, which certainly makes things a lot easier. But uh, there should be a lot of scrabbling and running around and trying to problem solve as we go. But I wanted to share with you a little bit as to why I have to solo this boat up here. Uh, Spawn Ocean Racing, my company that operates this boat, um, we're in a pretty tricky situation as we go into the end of 2022 here. We've not received a, a single order in about 90 days now and the next two events on here from Southampton to Reykjavik, we should have gone up to Norway and then across from Norway to Reykjavik. They've both been cancelled because we've ended up with crew sizes too small, too, too close to our minimum or below our minimum that we were unable to operate the events as we'd expected and we've had to cancel the events. So um, it's a very tricky situation right now and one which is only compounding a massive problem which we already had uh, due to COVID, which of course affected everybody. We we basically cancelled out uh, 350,000 pounds worth of work from 2020 and 2021 and we already had a debt going into the beginning of 2020 from a cancelled event, uh, the ARC 2019, where the boat that we had that we were going to use for that Challenger, our Volvo 60, had sustained damage. The boatyard supposedly fixed it. Unfortunately, when the boat set off, it was not fixed and they had to cancel their event. It's just been one of those things, a rough ride after a rough ride after a rough ride. So I'm trying now to find a solution to that going forward because if the company goes bankrupt, then there is no way for anybody to get their money back, which would be an absolute travesty. Somebody said to me the other day, why don't you get a real job? And I had a look at that as a realistic way of dealing with the situation. And of course, very quickly you realize that the debts of a company uh, balanced against the potential earnings of an individual, even if you're doing something like driving a super yacht, it, I recognize that it would take about a decade to pay back the things we've got to do. So. Rather than be beaten, it's a bit like going into a storm or, or some kind of tricky situation at sea. The question now is, what do we got and what do we need? What we have is still access to this beautiful boat. This boat was bought by a supporter who wanted to support the Ocean Globe race that we were going to get into in 2023. That event unfortunately was cancelled by the organisers or at least our division within it was cancelled by the organisers at the end of 2021 which created yet another stream of problems for me. But we still have access to the boat now. She needs some jobs doing. She's not perfectly suited to everything that we want to do but I figured I can use this resource while I have it. We've got the cameras. Um, I still haven't become a, any worse sailor than I ever was before. Clearly the financial uh, responsibilities that are on me now are something which I'm struggling to deal with, but I still have over 300,000 miles of sailing. And before we get pushed completely beneath the waves here, perhaps it's time to leverage that and do as much as we possibly can with social media, um, with the Patreon group who have been so supportive, have been such a lifeline for me all the way through COVID, all the way through the, the trials and tribulations right up to today. Um, if I do as much as I possibly can here and we grow the channel as far as we possibly can, maybe there's a chance of digging our way out of this with reputations and businesses still intact and along the way helping people being safer on the water and enjoying their sailing more. So 
I've spoken to people in my industry, people who own boats, who own companies here in the last week while I've been in Southampton and across the board, everybody is having a hard time. Uh, one company's gone from four boats to one boat. One, two, three of the companies I know are now closing up shop and putting their boats on the market. Another company went bust, went bankrupt, uh, managed to kind of buy back their name, but they're still very much on the edge of whatever they're able to do right now. So I think just piling ahead as I have done before is not going to work. So I'd rather be open about the situation. I'd rather be as uh, as uh, forthright as I can about the situation I'm in. And if I can dig my way out, that this might yet serve as some kind of uh, beacon for those who are in their own difficulties. And maybe it's not just the story of the sailing. Maybe it's a story of getting out of the difficulties coming from COVID that's also something I can share. So what is it that we have to do? Well, I have job lists. <laughs> I have job lists upon job lists upon job lists relating to all different areas of the boat. Um, the, I try and divide things up by electronics, mast, plumbing, uh, deck, sails. If I try and just do one job list, it's really impossible for me to then keep everything in my head all at one time and be checking and going through it all. I'm not really a spreadsheet kind of person. It's much easier when it's a book like this and it's tangible. So I reckon we can start to get into these things. I can take you along for the ride. They'll be shorter, they'll be longer. Um, there won't be much editing involved in this. I'm here with my iPad, which I am rapidly becoming I'm rapidly getting to the conclusion that I shouldn't interact with electronic devices. Just getting the video off this GoPro camera and into the iPad has proven hugely difficult, but I will persevere on. The first job we're going to have a look at is we need to get the hatch back on this boat. I've been painting it in the last couple of days. Let's have a look at that job, see if we can't move forward at least a day with one useful job. Okay, well, let's go out on deck. Let's see what's going on. I've got a, uh, a GoPro camera now, which gives us a little bit more stabilization and a little bit of a wider lens. Hopefully that adds somewhat to uh, the experience, not just my old phone. Here we go, here we are in Southampton. This is Town Key Marina. They've been treating us very, very well and uh, it's a nice place to hang out. I've been here a number of times before and I can never quite work out what these ruins were all about. But then I had a look inside the marina and uh, there used to be uh, a flying boat, is that what they called it, aeroplane? Obviously a flying plane, but a flying boat um, dock here. And this was the kind of walkway system that um, you came down and got onto the flying boat. And there's some awesome images of those flying boats taking off from here. Um, here we are alongside at the, uh, the kind of initial dock. And over here we've got a, uh, a series of gear. There was actually a bit of a plan before we got to Southampton that we were going to be um, selling this boat. We had someone who was interested to buy it. Um, it deal didn't go through. We took off there the sails which are on board, which are part of my Open 60, and uh, tools and safety gear, which was going to be not connected with the boat. They're still down there now. And then over here are the sails that relate to this boat. So it's a good time really to be uh, starting this new round with the uh, Mariner. The boat's in a position where it's been kind of stripped clear of all the gear, which is uh, excess gear. It's only got on board what it needs. So we've got a number of jobs we need to do. I guess before we have a look at the hatch, I'll just take you through some of the other things we've got to do. Look, we've got some rope work here. Staysail was up for quite a number of days in the Atlantic and it's chafed through in this area. That's obviously the sheath on the mast uh, chafing away at the, uh, at the halyard. We've got the red jet uh, slip sliding its way out of its harbour here. Um, we've got uh, bits of rust and things on the bow here we've got to deal with. We've got a little bit of rigging to do here. Again, a spinnaker halyard also chafed. A little bit confused with that one because it actually comes out of a sheath on the mast and goes through what's called a spectacle, which should mean that it's kind of chafe free. But here we are. Wow, he's really slip sliding this thing around. Look at that. Okay, and then uh, we've got here at the base of the mast, We've got some rope which um, we separated out. I think I did a, uh, a short about this, a Facebook uh, short or a one minute little thingy bob on YouTube or, good Lord. He's super noisy about it. I guess each individual captain's got their own way of getting the thing out of dock. Some of them just like creep out. This one wants a bit of a fanfare. Yeah, so anyway, this was uh, an old damaged rope which um, was no good really anymore for the boat. 
but obviously from the core of it I was able to separate out about 40 meters of 12 strand uh, 10 mil Dyneema which is super useful for lashings we're gonna be looking at those and then the sheath has been cut up into about three meter sections here and we're gonna make some sail ties out of it you know if you're in a period where you've got very little money coming in you have still got jobs you need to do it's a time to look around and find out where you can make um, some uh, some cuts in your in your budget right if I go and buy sale ties from the sale maker they're gonna want about uh, 10 US dollars per sale tie for this kind of size of boat because they because they're so big to go around the um, sale but if you cut up your old rope it's basically kind of for free right so what do we got over here we've got um, uh, the storm saws, the uh, storm jib and the storm trisol we've got uh, oh, that's the J5 in that brick bag. A bit strange that it's in a brick bag. We do have some deck bags. We're going to be transferring these into a later date. We've got a uh, A6 in a bag there. Uh, we've got the um, uh, like a reaching staysail. This boat doesn't have a normal staysail at the moment, although it's something I want to put onto it. Um, it. Basically, this boat runs with just a big jib. It's not a cutter rig. It doesn't have a jib and then a staysail. It's got. A, basically a jib and that's it but it does have a stay so it goes inside the spinnaker the only problem we've got at the moment is we only have one furler <laughs> so we can either have the spinnaker up or we can have the uh, furled stay up up we'll, we'll improve on this uh, what else we got underneath here is our J3 which we'll be getting out for this trip inside this bag is a very tired uh, light spinnaker something like an A2 I uh, believe that the previous owner of this boat has an A4 sitting in storage here for us. So we're maybe going to look at that while we're here. And then down here, we've got a Code 5, or that's a Code 5. And this, there's another spinnaker here. I don't know exactly what it is. We'll unpack it. We'll see what's going on. Uh, this is kind of an interesting area. Um, when we did the Newport Bermuda race, we had a big issue with the Vang. Um, the main was eased with the Vang not being let off, the hydraulic van not being let off, and it actually damaged the bottom of the Vang. So all this here is all brand new, and you can see the scars where the Kevlar deck luckily resisted the uh, lovemaking approaches of the Vang. Okay, and then in the cockpit, this is the job I'm going to get on with this evening. Um, the hatch, very simple job. It's uh, needed repainting for a long time that was all really flaky and nasty what i did discover when i was in um, nova scotia with this boat during the winter is that well it's a kind of a common story really you've got epoxy paint it's a little bit more complicated to put on because you've got two parts you've got to mix together it's definitely more expensive so it always happens when a campaign or when the ownership of a boat has gone a little bit soft then you people get into having uh, single pack paint polyurethane paint it's cheaper you just you know pour it in the tray and off you go and it's fine and I can tell you that pretty accurately I can tell you that it lasts about eight or nine years when it's on top of epoxy in the what we've had here what we've had on pretty much every boat I've ever um, had like this these older race boats people always step away from using epoxy paint and get into use single pack paint inside this boat so much of the paint has peeled off during the winter in Nova Scotia it's ridiculous because condensation down the back of the um, the paint and then with the cold and then the heat and the cold and the heat of us being inside the boat and then coming off the boat leaving it freezing it's uh, it's just lifted all the paint off so the entire bow I'm slowly getting in there and getting that painted um, the inside of that hatch the inside of a lot of the lockers it's all the paints been peeling off so that's been a big job um, getting that guy back on basically what's happened is uh, I just had to remove all of these screws along the edge here and then all the way down here and then prise up the um, 5200s that was holding it down and then I was able to get that hatch off and uh, and get it out of there a bit of a hassle to do but um, it's something actually I want to do in the end which is make a much bigger hood here that really kind of covers the front end of the cockpit it's a design from the 90s where you have like no protection whatsoever in the cockpit but even if it's just from spray and breeze and definitely from those big green waves when they come down the deck it'd be so much nicer having a Volvo 70 style hood here so in the end you know when we get to that point an opportunity perhaps to improve here but once this guy goes back into position we have the normal open and close kind of slidey hatch cover that's going to be uh, a nice one um, Yesterday I was uh, servicing the winches. We have a, a normal kind of requirement to service the winches on the boat, but there was two winches, uh, this one and this one. 
uh, the tops of them were completely sealed down and very, very difficult to move. And uh, for the year that I've owned the boat, I haven't taken them off. because I've been struggling just with how to get them off. Now we've got a little bit more time. We're here actually in a warmer place. I got in here, I got a nice little um, plastic scraper tool, which I'll show you. And I was able to get in here and finally loosen the tops of these. So this guy's good to go. This one's already been off and um, the inside of it, it was dry like the Sahara. I've literally never seen a winch uh, worse. Uh, there's no way that these winches have been serviced in the last, well, I know not two years because of COVID, but a year with me for sure not done. Two years before that COVID and the previous owner, but I would say add another two or three years at least before that, these winches have never been serviced. More aeroplanes, it's busy, busy here. I'm not used to it. I'm normally in Nova Scotia. There's no nothing moving around me it's kind of exciting there's ferries and planes and so tomorrow we're going to do um these two winches we'll get in there and have a look at those together the gopro i've got the ability to stick it on my head and then kind of give a point of view i'm still learning really how to do this kind of interactive style i know there's a lot of other sailing channels i have failed miserably in my task of showing what it is to be on the boat when we have crew on board because i just find it so awkward to be talking to the camera like this or taking the camera and showing the cockpit area and things while other people are doing their work it, it feels very kind of awkward to me so um, we've got someone joining the boat in Iceland who's gonna uh, do that for us Tom it's gonna be awesome he's gonna actually film what's going on here and then obviously the trip from here to Reykjavik I can film it in the kind of classic style I've done like this so we've got um, we've also got oh yeah yeah we've got a job that we have to do on this winch if you've ever wanted to see the uh, inside of a three-speed uh, driven winch, here's your opportunity. I got involved with this winch to work with this thing. We have the grinder over here, and we'll look at grinders later on, but basically these switches turn things on and off. Um, the one at the back turns on and off the main sheet winch. The one at the front turns on and off this gearbox uh, at the front, and then you select one side or you select the other side. So we select this side, and then we turn the winch handle. At the moment, this is a kind of like a medium speed that the winch does. When I go the other way, this is in trimming speed. If I press this guy in and turn it, we've got the same utility speed here, but then when I turn it the opposite direction, I've got high speed. So high speed, utility speed, and then I flick this guy, and utility speed turns into trimming speed. Well, the issue was that it had no trimming speed available, so I stripped the whole winch down completely rebuilt the, rebuilt the bottom of it which is another YouTube short I did the other day about replacing those little column things that are in there I only discover when I put it all back together I'd forgotten to put one little pin in so <laughs> we'll take that apart and have a look again with the camera in the POV position you can see what that's about okay what else have we got one of the other jobs I want to do is down here at the back of the boat we've got these uh, connections here for our backstays there's something can you see what's wrong here got a little bit of polish on them from uh, recent cleaning but what's wrong is that these shackles now we've got something round here that is up against the flat interior space in this uh, hanger arrangement this tang arrangement on the back of the boat you can see here a little bit of marks where the shackle used to be the other way around they have been like this since I got the boat and it's only doing this first proper voyage with it. I looked over the back here when I was having a pee one day. I'm like, whoa, 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 that is completely wrong. You shouldn't have something round like that up against something with a flat side because the contact point between those two pieces of metal is so minimum. Um, you're only talking about a, like probably a square couple of millimeters of the edge of this shackle in contact with here. So this needs to be removed and turned around and reconnected there. Same on that side. And then we need to add some uh, safeties on the back here where we've got these slings, a little uh, um, kind of made up in Dyneema slings here holding the, uh, the rigging together. We want something else which goes over, which in case this breaks, we don't, this is a dangerous triangle here already. We don't want this pinging forwards towards the driver, towards people that are working with the backstay here. So we're gonna do some little bit of work on the back there. Um, we've got quite a few jobs to get into. We've also got electronics. Um, the instruments at the mast are not working, so we need to have a look at those. What else we got going on here? Right, the oh. other one I was saying is the four peak. She's empty at the moment. I don't know if you can see there's some, some bits of it a little bit whiter than others. It was super, super bad in here with the paint having literally fallen right off the, uh, off the boat. The ceiling in there was falling off, so 
I'm putting single pack paint in there and uh, it's not a great application for it because it gets moved around so quickly and so harshly in there with sails. That needs to be epoxy paint, but we need also the Kevlar to be covered. Um, water is a natural plasticizer for Kevlar, makes it softer. We've got to cover it up. So we're going to do that now as a quick job. Um, just get some paint on it so it's sealed. And then later on, we'll get somebody in there with a uh, some like soda crystals um, with a, a media blaster and we'll get all that paint off and start again. Okay, so that's a quick look at some of the jobs we've got to do and a bit of an idea of how I'm going to do this from now on. This uh, new GoPro, if I can get my head around it, has much better stabilization so you're not bouncing around as we used to be when I was using my phone. Um, we've got a rare opportunity here to kind of put this boat together in the next two weeks and then uh, I'll be filming as I go through to Iceland and uh, see if we can get a little bit ahead on the content so you're not left waiting for two weeks to see what happens next but um, get ourselves up to Iceland and then upload all the uh, the footage to you we're going to be turning around we've got another crew joining the boat and we'll be filming everything down to Newfoundland so there's a lot coming and any support that you can give to this uh, endeavor would be much appreciated as say I'm going to use uh, my skills uh, to try and leverage a solution out of this uh, problem that I'm in I don't want to have anybody uh, be in any kind of difficult situation because of something I've put together however it is that it's come about so I figure the best way is to work my ass off and uh, if making content here is the way to do it rather than just going sailing as it was before I'm more than happy to oblige so we're going to do a lot more POV stuff we're going to do a lot more with the GoPro so you can get a bigger idea of what's going on and we've got this fantastic challenge coming up of sailing uh, 1200 miles up to Iceland on this 85 foot boat so if you think that's worthwhile if you think that's something you'd like to add your support to please go below and click the like button and go to subscribe if you haven't done that before you can also go over to patreon forward slash the mariner We've got a little community of people that's been so important to me during covid and uh, there's seamanship videos there there's uh, more content and there's more interactive content with me and there's a great opportunity to expand your sailing knowledge and your safety and get out on the water uh, as best you can in the coming season so from here on board Osprey. Let's uh, leave that one for now and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.